question that would please God. There is our rock and our redeemer. I don't know if there's a family in America who can't say they've been touched by cancer in powerful ways. When cancer is caught early, they're much more able to be treated. When cancer is caught in its early stages, the treatment usually goes much better than when it has a chance to spread and grow. The earlier the diagnosis is made, the better the chance of survival. But if a cancer is allowed to grow, let go, and spread, and unchecked, it will sink its teeth into a person and spread until it ultimately becomes untreatable. Temptation is the same way. If we catch it early, we have a much better chance of overcoming it. The longer we allow temptation to live in our lives, the stronger its hold on us becomes. Day by day it grows, it spreads, and it sinks its claws deeper and deeper into our souls until one day it seems as if there's no hope of ever overcoming the temptation and the sins. A sort of a snowball effect. You know, when you tell one little white lie, what you have to do to cover that white lie up is tell another little lie someplace else. And then tell another lie to cover that one up, and another one to cover these three up, and the lies get bigger and bolder, and you find yourself rolling down a hill like a cartoon character trapped in a snowball of your own creation, mixed up in a web, tangled and unable to cut your way out even with a machete. If we could just catch it at the beginning, if we could just nip it in the bud before it has a chance to sprout and grow, if we could just crush the egg of sin before it had the chance to hatch, we'd have a fighting chance. All too often we ignore temptation or we play with it like a fire, enjoying the promise of warmth and light, but soon we realize that those who play with fire get burned. And we play with temptation and allow it to grow in our lives, and when it bears its fruit of sin, we act shocked. How could this happen? How could this sin come out? How could I fail yet again to overcome this sin? Temptation, caught early, is more easily conquered than end stage sin. Temptation, caught early, is easier to overcome than end stage sin. 1 Corinthians tells us that no temptation seized us except that which is common to all people. And God is faithful. He will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. But when we are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that we can stand up under it. Sometimes we feel like there's no escape. But if we really took a moment to stop and think about it, and we look back over the circumstances that led up to our sin, God had provided a way out. It was just 20 miles back down the road, or 10 miles back down the road, and we ignored the exit signs, and we kept on plowing ahead, hoping that there'd be another exit before we ran out of gas. We wanted to stay on the Sin Expressway just a little bit longer, and a little bit longer. And we wanted to get off just before the accident, but there's no exit. When you get there. Temptation, caught early, is more easily conquered than end stage sin. David learned this lesson the hard way. As we study this well-known story together this morning, let's look for the exit opportunities that David had and just ignored. That he kept driving deeper and deeper <coughs> into Sin County. And notice that the more he ignores the chances that God gives him to repent and turn from his sin, the deeper he gets into sin. 
And finally, notice how the more, the deeper he gets into sin, the greater difficulty it will be to get out. He will suffer great consequences. And so instead, he decides to continue down the path of selfish destruction all the way to its bitter end. Our passage today is 2 Samuel chapter 11, which Steve read for you. It will be on the overhead, but if you'd like to follow along in your Bible, if you'd like to take notes in your Bible, I'll give you a second to find that. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11 opens up. David has placed himself into a situation of temptation that will ultimately lead to his final and his greatest failure. His greatest black mark on his reign will come because he just leaves himself open to the area of temptation. Listen in verse 1, 2 Samuel 11, 1. And this is where we begin the overhead, Andrew. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. A year before this took place, the king of the Ammonites had died. David had been on friendly terms with this king. And so he sent messengers to the, to the king's son, the new king, to express his condolences. The messengers, when they arrived, the king talked to his counselors, and the counselors said, no, 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 they're not here to express condolences. They're here to spy out the land. You know what a bloodthirsty, battle-hungry king David is. No, 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 you've got to send these guys away. You've got to send them packing. So what's he do? He embarrasses them. He shaves off half of their beard, which is, you know, wall. You know, if you saw Walt walk in with half a beard, it would look pretty strange, right? These guys' beards are their pride. It shows wisdom. It shows age. It shows respect. And to cut half of the beard off is an absolute slap in the face. But to make matters worse, they took a pair of scissors and they cut a hole in their robe right around their buttocks. So that when these guys were walking down the road... All their indecency was exposed. This was a terrible shame. And so David responds, and he sends people out to battle. And they attack the Ammonites, and they fight. Then the winter comes, they have to take a year off. This is the one year anniversary of that insult when David sends his troops out to do battle, to get vengeance for these guys who suffered this bitter, Humiliation. But notice where David is in all of this. It says, in the spring of the year, when the kings go out to battle, David remained at Jerusalem. While his soldiers were camped out on the field, in the dew, in the rain, in the cold, David was at home in his palace, safe and warm. Where should David be? He should be with his troops. David here <coughs> expresses a sin of laziness. He should be out fighting with his men, and yet he is too lazy to go out with them. <coughs> so David is lazy. This is a sin. What should he do about it? What could he do about it? He should say, wait a second. You know, I need to be out there with my men. He could say, oh, guys, I'm really sorry. Uh, I didn't come out with you. He could apologize. He could go out and be with them. <laughs> this would earn him the respect and the loyalty of his troops. That's what David could have done. But he didn't. Instead, David stays home with nothing better to do than to get in trouble with the girls. And trouble is exactly what he gets himself into. Verse 2 picks up. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. 
Now, you have to understand a little bit about Hebrew culture here at the time. Roofs were flat. People went out on the roofs in the evening to get cool. That was the place they did a lot of things. Now, some people will say, here's Bathsheba. She's out there naked, showing off all of her wares. And, you know, Bathsheba is tempting David. She's doing this on purpose because she knows David's going to be up there. She's trying to catch his eye by doing this. But when I was in India, I found something very interesting. Next slide, Andrew. Do you see? Hit that light for me, Bill. Do you see this picture right here? This is a picture of a man on the roof next to my building, shaving and doing his hair with his daughter. Right there next to him. You can see a puddle of water here where they were cleaning their kid. Next slide. Here is a picture from the roof looking down in the alleyway where you can see all these buckets and these, um, these basins filled with water. And this woman doing her breakfast, getting her breakfast ready. I saw a woman down there cleaning her son. I saw it was really funny because she had given him a bath and then she went back in and I heard this water spilling and I looked over and the little kid's standing there and he's peeing in the, um, in the <laughs> flip flop, the sandal that's sitting on there. And then he stops and he walks over here and he pees on something else and then he stops and he walks over and I'm wondering, I think, does this woman know what he does when he does it? She obviously should. It was just so funny, like, there's this little puddle of pee in the flip flop. It was, it was pretty funny. <laughs> They knew I was there. I knew they were there. They were on their rooftop, bathing, cleansing. Many times, we traveled down the road. We'd be driving along, we'd drive over a bridge, we'd look down at the river, and there were the women, bathing. And not once did I ever see unity. When they bathed, they would squat, they would pull one arm in, they would wash, they would put the arm back out, they would pull the other arm in, they would wash, they would put the arm out. Not once did I ever see nudity. They knew that people would see them. It's just too crowded. There's too many people around. You cannot do things like that in public. Bathsheba was not naked. She was not out there tempting David. The story doesn't talk about Bathsheba's motives or why she's doing things, but it's the story is about David. David saw a beautiful woman, me, David. Me want woman. It's about David. Okay? David is in this position to see this beautiful woman because he's not out in the troops, on the field with the troops. David's sin of laziness, unrepentant sin, blossoms into the sin of lust. Now at this point, it should be very clear to David what he should do. Repent. Thank God for the wives, plural, that he has given him. Thank God for the position that he has as king. Thank God for his many blessings. But what does David do? That's what David could have done. But instead, David decides to investigate this hot chick and find out about her. Samuel chapter 3. I mean, excuse me, verse 3. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported that this is Bathsheba. Now it doesn't stop there. Daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah the Hittite. In this one fraction of a sentence, daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah, the Bible tells us that David had every reason in the world to say, whoa, okay, she's off limits. First of all, she's married, right? David knows better. But, who is Eliam? Who is Uriah? Uriah is one of David's top special forces, elite. David has 30 men that stand out above and beyond all of his army. Men that can, committed amazing feats that would stagger the imagination. Killing hundreds of men by themselves. Doing just incredible feats of strength, prowess, skill. And Uriah is listed among these 30 men. But... Bathsheba's father, Eliam, is also listed as one of David's most committed soldiers in his army. A leader in his army. But, more importantly than that, Eliam's father has a strange name that is very hard to remember and hard to say. Ahithophel. Let me say it again because I said it wrong. Ahithophel. I told you it's hard to say. Ahithophel is David's